Today on Context, facing the ethical obligation for a country to right its wrongs. Just how does a Truth and Reconciliation Commission make that progress? We'll find out today. I'm Lorna Duick and you're watching Context, the show that looks at life beyond the headlines. Canada sent over 150,000 children to residential schools to be stripped of their Aboriginal identity, culture and language. The first school opened in the 1870s. They were government funded and church run. The last one closed in 1996. In 2008, Canada formally apologized for their involvement and has launched an ongoing reconciliation commission. Why is it important to continue the cross-cultural dialogue? Let's put it in context. Well, we're going to discuss this big issue of the residential schools today with a number of guests and with our studio audience. And our first guest will give us insight into the system and the reconciliation process that has taken so much of Canada's history. Elder Barney Williams and Elder Shirley Williams are survivors of the residential school system. And we're also joined by Justice Murray Sinclair, the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. His father was a residential school survivor. And I want to just say thank you all for being here. We're going to mention that we're also having in the studio today, and you'll see them later on set, we've got some of those who are participating in the apology process, in the reconciliation process. Reverend David McDonald, who has been part of forming the entire launch of the commission, is with us, and you'll see him later in the show. Also, academic Victoria Freeman, whose own father, own grandfather, was part of the residential school administration. So it's going to be an interesting day figuring this out, but surely, Barney, I think we should start with you as survivors. Barney, you did not go home between the age of 8 and 13 because you were in a government and church-run residential school. What did you lose? Well, there was actually five years, five and a half. You were five and a half years old. When so I was 13, yeah. Well, I think what I lost was, uh, of course, the teenage years that, that a normal child experiences. I, I didn't have that opportunity because I was a teenager when I went home and I lived uh, two miles from my home. It was just around the, the point actually. Uh, was on the west coast of Vancouver Island. So I didn't understand why, why we, were, we were made to stay there didn't uh, speak English initially. Of course, I had to learn that pretty quick because that was part of the, uh, the thing that you had to do. You were punished if you didn't, if you didn't speak English. And it was hard because we, we spoke our, or I spoke my language and it, it was difficult to move in that other direction, to move because I didn't understand a lot of the words that were being spoken to me, so. Barney, did you see your parents in those eight years from when you were five to 13 years old? No, I didn't. But you were only two miles away from home. What kind of fear, what kind of control was going on in your childhood that that was possible? Well, there was a lot of things that happened to me, right, very early into my experience in the school. Uh, I was, of course, one of the little boys that were abused by a pedophile, and uh, so there was a lot of fear around that. There was a lot of fear. Because he would say, you know, you can't do this, or I'm going to kill you, or, you know, and then you, you kind of believe the guy, right? I mean, you're just a little child, not knowing what, not understanding what's going on. A part of that and part of I'm not sure that I understand even today um, why I didn't go home. I think it was part of the the taking the I guess the Indian out of us or whatever they were trying to do make us something that we weren't. Right? Mm -hmm. We became. Justice Murray Sinclair. I don't know how 
you have the, where do you even begin with that? That a family didn't go two miles away and get its child back. We've heard many instances of uh, uh, schools that were located right in the middle of a community where children could see their families across the fence and weren't allowed to go and visit with them or see them. Um, so the, the, uh, the intent of the schools was to separate the children from the families. That's very clear. It's right in the, the beginning documents of the, behind the establishment of the residential school system. To separate children from their families, to reduce the influence of families uh, upon the children so that the transmission of culture, the transmission of identity, the sense of uh, self that was different from uh, how those in charge of the system saw Canadians uh, would be lost to the children. And there was a, <clears throat> a Darwinistic belief that Aboriginal people were inferior, were savages, were something less than human, and that they needed to be saved from themselves by being placed into institu institutions where they would be civilized and indoctrinated into a different way of thinking uh, through the process of Christianization. And as a result, uh, the children who went to those schools lost uh, complete uh, contact with their families in many instances. And even those who didn't lose complete contact were damaged in their relationship with families because if you can imagine what it's like as a child to be taken away from your community and from your family and not to have your family come and rescue you from a, a situation that you don't want to be in, uh, after a while you blame your family. After a while you begin to believe that those people who are in charge of your life on a daily basis so control you that you may as well give in to them. It's, it's like the Stockholm Syndrome almost. And as a result, many of the young children who went through the school system came out of the school system with a damaged view of their identity, with a damaged view of their families, and went on in their own way to damage their own families. And so it's, it's not hard to believe that it happened because it was intended to happen. I guess I can understand why parents wouldn't go back and get their children. Well, there's a great deal of evidence that parents, in fact, resisted but the government did everything they could to stop them through the use of law. Laws were passed that said you couldn't leave uh, the community to go to any place outside of the reserve unless you had a pass. There was a policy that was put in place that, that required that. And if you were outside of your community and you didn't have a legitimate pass from the Indian agent, then you would be arrested and detained and taken back to your community. There were also laws against protests, for example. You couldn't gather together there were laws against gatherings of any significance, the potlatch and Sundance laws. All of those things were intended to prevent people from protesting. Uh, Aboriginal people were prevented from going to court. They couldn't hire a lawyer because there were laws against that. So it was through the use of law and through the use of government policy that parents were effectively prevented from protesting. We're going to come back, Shirley, and hear from you. And we're going to find out just what can be done as this truth moves into reconciliation. After the break, we'll meet a woman whose grandfather, a Presbyterian minister, was involved in a residential school. How did that impact her? And we'll introduce you to the United Church of Canada and hear more on how reconciliation for these wrongs is taking place. Stay tuned.